Thank you for being here tonight and being in your place in this midweek service as we kick off these electives. And we're looking forward uh, to the next uh, 10 weeks as uh, we're in various topics around the campus and in here, as Pastor mentioned, talking about uh, a journey of joy and a book study in Philippians. Pastor kicked it off last week with a journey of confidence, and we're going to continue in that uh, this evening, and the other electives happening around the campus as well. So thank you for being here uh, tonight and a part of that. Take your Bibles, Philippians chapter number one, Philippians in chapter number one, and we'll go to our scripture reading in just a moment, lay some groundwork. And then we'll get right into this Bible study together tonight, building a little bit off of the uh, introduction last week, and then uh, each week building upon that as we go through the great book of Philippians. So appreciate you being here tonight. And uh, Dr. Lee Robertson uh, coined the phrase, three to thrive, and talked about the need of a midweek service, the prop pole in the middle of the week, to gather together, to fellowship, to worship, to sing, to give, and to hear the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. And we pray that tonight will be an encouragement to you and accomplish God's work in your life and give you what you need uh, to finish this week strong, coming down the home stretch into the Lord's day. If you would, and if you're able, stand. Philippians chapter 1, out of reverence for the reading of God's Word. And let's look together tonight, if you would, beginning in verse number 12. But I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren of the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of good will. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be manifested in my body, whether it be by life or by death. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we thank you, Lord, tonight for the privilege to gather and to open your word. And Lord, I pray that you would help all of us collectively to set aside the distractions and the thoughts and the various things we came into this room with our minds upon. And help us now to intentionally Focus on you and your word. And Lord, tonight we ask that we would hear from thee. We ask tonight, Lord, that your work, uh, your word would be able to accomplish its work in our life. And Lord, may our spirit, may our life, may our heart, may our minds be yielded to thee. And we pray that tonight your work would accomplish something in us that would draw us closer to you. And that would help us to live the life that you've created for us. And for this, we certainly promise to praise and to thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So we're going to continue this series, A Journey of Joy, as we look to the latter part of Philippians chapter 1 tonight and look at a journey of clarity. A journey of clarity. How did Paul have such clarity and missed all that he was facing? Boy, sometimes in life, it's tough to have clarity. If you ever received some some information, a voicemail, a text message, and you were trying to figure out exactly what was being communicated. It's like the church in Louisville, Kentucky, that was trying to teach its members and attenders the Ten Commandments, and they were having a hard time getting those truths across, so they simplified them just a bit. I wanted you to see them. This was their version of the Ten Commandments. Number one, just one God. Number two, put nothing before God. Three, watch your mouth. Four, get yourself to Sunday meeting. Five, honor your mom and pa. Six, no killing. Seven, no fooling around with another fella's gal. Eight, don't take what ain't yours. Nine, no telling tales or gossiping. And ten, don't be hankering for your buddy's stuff. And that, that seemed to kind of get through. That gave them a little bit of clarity, you know, as they were trying to figure out exactly what all that meant. 
It's like the man that was going into a country store and as he made his way in, he noticed a sign there on the glass door as he opened it said, danger, beware of dog. And as he walked in, he noticed a harmless old hound dog asleep on the floor there next to the cash register. So he got his supplies and went up there to pay and he asked the store manager, he said, now, is this the dog that folks are supposed to be aware of? And the store manager said, yep, that's him. And he was kind of puzzled by that. And he said, now that doesn't look like a dog that's very dangerous. Why is it you got to be aware of him? And he said, well, you see, before I put that sign up, this is the dog that everyone kept tripping over. And uh, sometimes what we think and what's there doesn't really add up. Now, as we go to the book of Philippians and we think about the life of Paul, Paul had one supreme purpose in life, and that was to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul had one goal, one, one mission, one purpose in which to live for, and that's all that mattered. After the Lord Jesus Christ arrested his attention with the bright light that shone down upon Paul on the road to Damascus, after Jesus Christ had saved his soul, nothing else mattered in life to Paul than seeing people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. As we come to the book of Philippians, Paul is under house arrest, and he writes this letter to the believers in Philippi. The believers there had much difficulty understanding why Paul was uh, under such suffering, and they had experienced it there, and now here in Rome, here he is once again uh, going through persecution, and they were struggling with that in their own spirit. They were having some doubt, and so uh, Paul is doing what he can to encourage them through this letter, and he's letting them know that he is not discouraged. And one of the reasons that Paul could stay so focused and so uh, intent on his mission, even during such adversity, was because of the clarity that he had when it came to service to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, as I think about the life of the Apostle Paul and the opposition that he faced, and even this letter being penned while being chained in Rome, it is puzzling. How did Paul have such clarity? How did Paul see through all of that to what really mattered? What kept Paul on track? And I believe tonight as we unpack this passage, it'll be clear to us exactly why Paul had it, and hopefully it'll help you and I to have it as well. So let's look into our study tonight. And first of all, notice the perspective of Paul. Paul has an incredible perspective despite the opposition that he's facing. Now, more than anything else in Paul's life, he desired to be a missionary and to go take the gospel to Rome. Now, Rome was the great city, the hub of the Roman Empire, and Paul knew that if he could conquer this city for Christ, it would mean reaching millions with the gospel literally around the known world at that time. Paul dreamt of going to Rome as a preacher. And he's there, but not as a preacher, he's there as a prisoner. And to many, all of this would have looked like failure, but to Paul, it did not. He was so singular focused and concerned with sharing the love of Christ that he knew this had to be a part of God's plan. It was Paul that later said in Philippians chapter three, brother, and I count on myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. And Paul mastered focusing on just one thing, and his mission of taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to every person that he could. His dream to be in Rome and to be preaching and training and sending believers all over the known world at the time. The fact that he's under house arrest and in shackles while writing this letter did not deter him at all. He had a steadfast perspective. Paul did not find his joy in ideal circumstances. But he found his joy in others coming to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And if the circumstances that he happened to be in helped further that cause, then that's all that mattered to him. He kept his eyes on what truly was important. Incredible perspective. But let's break it down and notice letter A. First of all, the progress of the gospel. Look in verse 12. He says, But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. The things that have happened unto me. Well, what was happening unto Paul? Well, here Paul was in chains. Uh, Paul was under house arrest. Paul was scheduled to stand and to give his defense before Nero as a Roman citizen. And a lesser man certainly may have begun to question, what is God doing? 
may have begun to uh, fret over the fact that he's in prison, maybe uh, even become embittered, but not Paul. You see, Paul knew that his chains were a part of God's divine plan, and he understood that God makes no mistakes. He knew that God was in control, and Paul trusted him. The same God who used Moses' rod in Gideon's pitchers and David's sling was using the chains of Paul. 2 Timothy 2, 9, when I suffer trouble as an evil do or even under bonds, but the word of God is not bound. And Paul understood, listen, this isn't going the way that I thought it would go. It's not unfolding uh, the way that I uh, was dreaming that it would, but I'm not worried because God's in control. God knows what he's doing and God knows exactly what he wants to accomplish through my life. What seemed like a hindrance was actually a help. What seemed like an obstacle was actually something that God was about to use. And Paul had faith and Paul trusted and Paul knew this would work. We're reminded in Romans 8, 28 tonight that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And that's exactly how Paul felt about it. And we see the progress of the gospel, the furtherance of the gospel. Even after what had been done to Paul, Paul knew that it would work out. But notice letter B, the propagating of the gospel. Keep reading in verse 13. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. So Paul says, listen, I'm under house arrest, but it's okay. It's for the furtherance of the gospel. Then he expounds in verse 13, look at where the gospel is going. It's being propagated everywhere because of my bonds in Christ. You see, Paul is under house arrest and he is uh, imprisoned and, and uh, he's uh, to be uh, before Nero very soon. And so while he is chained to these prison guards on the right and on the left, he's witnessing and he's sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And no doubt as these men talk and no doubt as the conversation takes place in the barracks and no doubt as all of this begins to filter its way through and through Caesar's palace and other places that the gospel is being included. This is Paul's under house arrest and this is what he's telling us and as that's making its way through the gospel is being spread in fact by the time that Nero turned on the Christian community in AD 64 which would have been less than five years after Paul wrote this letter to the believers at Philippi history would bear fact that there were multitudes of converts in the capital city in less than five years the gospel going everywhere into the palace and into all other places. Why? Because of the bonds of Christ. Paul said, these chains that I'm wearing, this is part of God's will for my life. This fits in God's plan. God knows what he's doing and I trust him. And the gospel is being spread as a result. What an incredible perspective that Paul had. Reminded me of one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament, Joseph. Joseph, no doubt, at the end of his life could have looked back and had a jaded view on life. Joseph faced some injustices. Joseph was mistreated. Joseph was betrayed. Joseph could have had a chip on his shoulder. Joseph could have been bitter. But Joseph secured the presence of the Lord. The latter part of his life, looking back in Genesis 50, 20, he says, but for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good. To bring to pass, it is this day to save much people alive. Joseph said, looking back on it all now, I see nothing but the goodness of God. And Paul said, listen, brethren, don't worry about the fact that I'm in these bonds. Look at what's happening. Look at the gospel being spread. It's in the palace. It's in all other places. It's going everywhere. God is accomplishing his work. Paul was undeterred from the mission that God had given him. But notice as we continue in verse 14, the proliferating of the gospel. Look at verse 14. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. You know, enthusiasm begets enthusiasm. And zeal inspires zeal. And Paul was a leader. And his tireless commitment to the cause of Christ was motivating others to get going and sharing the gospel as well. It was Paul that said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be followers of me even as I also am of Christ. 
And people were watching Paul and his leadership and his example, and they were following after. You see, the believers in Rome were watching Paul and the fact that he was in bonds, and yet he was fearlessly witnessing for Christ. They literally began to get on fire for God. I mean, here's Paul in prison, in bonds, waiting uh, uh, an entrance in the court of Nero, and yet he consistently is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says the response of that, the outflow of that, the product of that example in, in Paul's life was many of the brethren, not few, many, many took note of that example. Many got involved. Many began to share their faith. And the Bible says they did it with great confidence, waxing confident by my bonds. The sentiment was if Paul could be winning souls to Christ while he was chained to Roman soldiers and restricted to the four walls of that hired house, then those out and about Rome who were free to go wherever they want, what what work could they accomplish for God? And Paul's example was inspiration for people to get involved in doing their part. You see, tonight every believer belongs in the game, not in the stands. And Paul was writing back to these believers at Philippi and saying, Hey, look up. Don't be discouraged. Don't be depressed. Don't be worried. Hey, I'm I'm in bonds in Rome, but God's in control. Man, you ought to hear what's happening. You ought to see what's going on over here. People are getting saved. In fact, people who weren't witnessing to anyone before, now they're going out. And they're not just going out. They're going out in confidence. It's incredible what's happening. Paul's encouraging these believers, look up. Don't be discouraged. God's on the throne. God is at work. Good stuff's happening. It's going to be okay. And I don't think it hurts you and I to hear a little bit of that tonight either. Look up. It's okay. God's on the throne. Good stuff's happening. Man, we had the core class on Sunday. Had about 50 new members in there. People recently accepting Jesus Christ as Savior and been baptized and coming and wanting to know how to be a part of the church and seeing people walk the aisle and accept Christ and seeing the baptistry water stirred and pastor standing Sunday night and preaching his heart out about going forward and thinking about what God is doing and thinking about what's just around the corner for our church. I'm telling you, church, it's good. Good things are happening. Paul said, don't you be discouraged. God's doing something special. Because of Paul's perspective, many brethren with confidence sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul encouraging these believers at Philippi. Hey, listen, look at what God's doing. But notice secondly in our study tonight, the problem with other believers. Now isn't it amazing? It seemingly... As soon as you get in the Bible to a really good thing, people getting saved, revival happening, you know, people being encouraged and, and God's going forward and something, then boom, it just followed up with some kind of opposition. And we know the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 12, yea, and all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But, but now here comes this problem. And the problem is found in these other believers. So notice with me in our study tonight, first of all, letter A, that some were envious Look at verse number 15 as we continue. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife. Verse 16. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. You see, some preachers were preaching Christ out of envy. They they were jealous of the Apostle Paul. They were envious of his success. They resented his influence in the Roman church, a church that had been founded by somebody else. Paul didn't have anything to do with that. But now here comes Paul into town, and that's all everybody can talk about. And some people didn't like that because they weren't talking about them. They're talking about Paul. So now they're out there preaching, but the Bible is clear they're doing it because they're envious of Paul. They don't like that people are talking about Paul. Heard about a chicken yard with a big hen house where a rooster had all of his hens laying eggs. And one day, two little boys were next door and they were 
playing football and they had a brand new white football. While they were playing, one of them accidentally kicked the football over the fence and it rolled out into that chicken yard. And that rooster hopped up and he walked over there and he walked around that football and walked around it again. Examined it real carefully, you know. And finally he called all those hens and he said, come out here, ladies. He got all those hens around that football and he said, now listen, girls. I don't mean to be negative, but here's the kind of eggs that they're producing next door. You need to step it up. And that's what happened. And all everybody was talking about was Paul and everybody else. They're like, man, we got to step it up. And now they get out there and the motive is envy. And they want to go out and they want to preach Christ. And then it says in verse 15 that somebody preached Christ even of envy and strife. The word translated strife here means fictitious rivalry. So, so there was this envy. It's all about Paul. Who, who does he think he is? And then it was this rivalry, this, this factitious, this contentious rivalry. We've got to go do our part. You know, it's interesting that the enemy will endeavor to pervert the advancement of the gospel every single time. And here God is doing something great. And here people are being inspired. And here many are going out. And they, with confidence, are sharing the gospel. But now here comes this opposition. And now you have this rift amongst the believers in Rome. President Truman said, it is amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. But with many believers in Rome, it mattered to them. And the fact that it was all seemingly going back to Paul truly bothered them. Can I challenge all of us tonight to have the spirit of John the Baptist? And notice in your notes in John chapter 3. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. Hath he that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. They were trying to rile John up. John, man, the crowds that Jesus is getting, they're a lot bigger than your crowds. And John said, what is your problem? That's what I was telling you. That doesn't bother me. That's my joy. I rejoice in the fact that that's happening. He must increase. I must decrease. But that wasn't the spirit of some of these believers in Rome. They were envious of Paul and what was being said about him. When you have these kinds of problems amongst believers, you know who loses? The lost. The lost. But we see that some are earnest. Look at verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of good will. Verse 17, they love, or, but of the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Paul said, listen, there's some, there's some knuckleheads out there, and, and, and they're trying to, to do me hurt, but there's some people out there that they want to see men saved, and they want it to be a blessing. They want it to encourage the heart of Paul. Paul said in Romans 10, 1, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Paul said, listen, I've got one goal in this thing. I want people to know Jesus. And there were some men who caught that and who took it and desired to see people saved as well, but wanted to be a blessing to Paul. Can I challenge you tonight? Decide to be an encourager. Decide to be an encourager. There's all kinds of believers in Rome, and everybody's talking, and there's a group over here that are envious and they're stirring up strife, and there's a group over here that are just doing their job and having a good spirit. And may Lancaster Baptist Church be made up of people doing their job with a good spirit. Not a spirit of envy, not a spirit of strife, but a spirit of unity. A spirit of encouragement. Hey, thank God for what he's doing. Hey, man, did you see what they had on their bus route? That's awesome. Hey, did you hear about what they had in their class? Man, that's great. Just encouraging people. 
Make it your mission. Every time you grace the campus of Lancaster Baptist Church, you want to encourage someone. Man, no one's ever handed me a bulletin that way. That was awesome. Thank you. you know. Man, the way you pass that offering plate, that was incredible. I mean, just be an encouragement. One morning, a woman opened her door to get the newspaper, and she was surprised to see a strange little puppy with her paper in his mouth. And she was delighted with this unexpected delivery service. So she went to the house and found some treats and brought it out to the puppy. Well, the following morning, she was horrified when she came to the door and opened the door and found the puppy sitting there. But this time, wagging his tail, he was surrounded by eight newspapers. And she had to spend the rest of her morning delivering them all back to the neighbors. But can I remind you tonight, that's what encouragement does. Encouragement inspires others to go forward. Encouragement means to put courage in. There were some people in Rome who had the audacity, Paul, it's not enough that you're in prison. It's not enough that you have a guard to the right and a guard to the left and you are shackled. That's not enough. So we're going to go out and we're going to do ministry so that we can hurt your name. We want you to feel worse. That was the motive of some. But some said, no, we truly want to see people saved. And while doing that, if we can encourage Paul, we want to encourage Paul. May our church be a body of people who have decided they want to encourage others. I love our pastor. I so appreciated his message on Sunday night as he shared his heart about going forward. And church family, can we all tonight decide we are going to go forward. We are encouraging others to go forward. We are encouraging our pastors. He leads us forward. That this is going to be a church with a positive peer pressure. That we are encouraging one another. And we want to follow the faith of the pastor that God has given to us. We want to be an encourager. Some were envious. Some were earnest. And as a result of that, we see letter C that Paul was encouraged. Look at verse number 18. And I love this. I love this about Paul. What then, he asked, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Wow. What an attitude and a spirit. Paul rejoiced that no matter if the gospel was preached to aid him or to add to his infliction, Christ was preached, that was enough, and he was going to rejoice. Paul was not condoning the motive of these that were against him. But he simply decided to rejoice wherever Jesus Christ was preached. That was his attitude. That was his spirit. Now you and I tonight have the spirit of Paul. There's going to be others that do it differently than we do. There might be others who do it better than we do it. But if they're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're not the enemy. Paul said, I know their motive isn't right. In fact, I've heard they're trying to hurt me. But I've also heard they're seeing people saved. And in that, yea, I rejoice. I thank God. I'm grateful that people are being saved. Now, God's going to bless his word as he pleases. And God is sovereign. And the Holy Spirit is still the Lord of the harvest. The Bible says in John 3, 8, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Listen, God is in control of all of that. Paul said, I can't control this. But I'm going to rejoice for the good that's happening. Would you and I have dreamed of using a man like Balaam, a psychic to convey a divine message? Probably not, but God did. Would we have called Caiaphas a prophet? Probably not, but God did. Remembering Jonah's miserable, unforgiving spirit, his bitterness, and his narrow-minded prejudice? Would we have blessed his preaching? Probably not, but God did. Would we have blessed another psalm of David after he committed adultery and murdered Uriah? Probably not, but God did. And I think Paul understood, listen, my focus is not on the man. My focus is on the message, and I am thankful that they are exalting Christ and souls are being one. I rejoice. What incredible maturity by Paul. Paul could have rallied the troops in his favor. 
Paul could have got those loyal to him that were trying to encourage him to go out and disturb some more trouble. That wasn't Paul's attitude at all. Paul said, listen, it doesn't matter. God's in control. They can do whatever they're doing for whatever reason they want. If people are being saved, I choose to rejoice. Church family, America needs revival. Lancaster and Palmdale needs a love of Jesus Christ. We don't have time to be at odds with this person and envious of this person and stirring strife over here and picking sides and this and that. And I'm not talking about not being worried about doctrine. I'm thankful that we have our church, Lancaster Baptist Church, that we have our doctrine, that we have our philosophy of ministry, that pastor has made some things clear. We're going in a direction of a certain sound. I'm thankful for all of that. But let's be mindful tonight of our spirit. Oh, okay, so somebody's a little different. But people are being saved. Praise God for that. that well, this person, they'd said something bad about us, but they're, they're still a believer. Praise God for that. We're not going to get sidetracked in, in, in the, the political game of making sure that our name is as we want it to be. Paul said, this life is not about me. It's about him. And if his name is being furthered, it doesn't matter what's happening to my name. What happens to his name is far more important. I love that about Paul. They're in shackles. The only thing that mattered was that souls were being won. We see his perspective. We see some of the problems, but notice with me as we close thirdly, the provision of the Holy Spirit. What gave Paul this clarity? How was Paul so focused? How did he see through all of this noise and stay on target? Well, we're going to find out. Because he had the Spirit of God. Letter A, we see that it was activated by prayer. Look at verse number 19. For I know this. For I know that this shall turn into my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul said, I am believing this to bring about my salvation. Paul here is not talking about gospel salvation or soul salvation, but he's talking about his physical well-being. He's talking about his personal vindication. He's talking about, I'm getting out of here. And I know I'm getting out of here because of your prayers and because of the Spirit of God that lives in me. 2 Corinthians 1.11, you are also helping together by prayer for us. That for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. Paul said, listen, I have confidence this is going to be all right. I have confidence God is going to see me through. And I have that confidence because of the confidence of the Spirit of God in me. And that's speaking loudly. And I'm hearing it clearly because of the prayers of others. It was activated by prayer. Paul said, I know God is going to see me through. I know it's because of your prayer. And I know it's because of the supply of the Spirit of God. Church family, may you and I pray one for the other. May we pray for our pastor. As we come to the Wednesday night Bible study and prayer time and we receive that prayer page and we hear of needs and maybe we get the notification on the app or whatever the case may be. Boy, let's be sure we pray because of the prayer of God's people. Paul was listening to the Spirit of God and he was being encouraged and he was getting some confidence that it was all going to be okay. The Spirit of God was helping him in this matter and the prayer of others was a great encouragement. But notice the provision of the Spirit also aligned Paul's purpose. Notice it in verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. Paul chained in shackles to Roman guards, but the prayer of the believers, the indwelling of the Spirit, it's aligning, it's focusing his mind on the purpose that God had given him. Paul had a steadfast attitude that the gospel must be spread no matter what. It didn't matter what suffering he was going through. It didn't matter what persecution he was facing. All that mattered was the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, as he is sharing this with the believers in Philippi, what an encouragement. 
They were downcast because of his suffering. They're, they were worried because of the prospect that if they proclaimed the gospel of Christ, that, that they were endured suffering as well. And, and Paul is encouraging them and Paul is telling them, listen, friend, I got to tell you, there's nothing to be worried about. I'm sitting here shackled, but I've never been more confident in my life. I know exactly why God has me here. I'm watching him work. I'm trusting in him. And you need to as well. He said, according to my earnest expectation. You study earnest expectation. It literally carries the idea that Paul was on his tippy toes. I mean, Paul was on that starting line. Paul said, man, let me get in that courtroom of Nero. I want to get in there. I mean, Nero was nuts. The guy thought he was God. He hated Christians. I mean, it basically was facing certain death. What was Paul's spirit? Let me get in there. I'm ready. Let's go. My earnest expectation, I'm ready right now. Wow. That was Paul's spirit. People praying for him. The confidence he finds in the spirit of God. According to my earnest expectation, he goes on in verse 20, and my hope. Paul had not lost his hope. He was still believing in the promises of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Suffering had not diminished his expectations. Christian, I don't know what it is you're going through. I don't know what it is you're facing. But may you and I be encouraged by the life of the apostle Paul tonight. Never lose hope. Paul said, I'm here. I'm in shackles. But I got my hope. They're not taking that from me. It's right here. I've got my hope. He says nothing. I shall be ashamed Sometimes when someone suffers or faces persecution or reproach, it can bring a spirit of recanting, but not in Paul. In spite of the suffering that he faced, he still had his, held his head high regarding the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel message. It was Paul that said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul said, listen, I'm not ashamed of this thing. It has me here in shackles, sure. It's not gone the way that I thought. You're right. But I'm not ashamed. My head's still up. God's on the throne. It's going to be all right. Hey, it doesn't matter the direction that culture and society goes. May God's people still hold their head up. It doesn't matter how small the minority is. If we have God, that's all we need. Paul said, listen, it doesn't matter. I'm in here chained to two of the elitist guards in the entire Roman garrison, and it doesn't even matter because I got God. Amen. Paul said, I'm going to be just fine. Wow. What clarity. Because of his personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I'm going to declare it with all boldness. Suffering did not intimidate Paul. He spoke with incredible boldness the gospel message. Certainly his prison guards would attest to this. He had a message all prepared for Nero, no doubt. The Bible says in Acts 4.31, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, and they were assembled together. And as they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Friend, may you and I, as we go to work tomorrow, speak the word of God with boldness. As you and I come into contact with someone who doesn't know Christ, let's speak the gospel with boldness. Let's take out a gospel track and let's invite someone with boldness. Let's share something we learned in our devotions with somebody tomorrow in boldness. Let's not be intimidated by being a Christian. Let's not lose our tongue because some people don't like it. Let's not cower down because it seemingly is offensive to some. Paul said, listen, I don't care. I'm in shackles, but I'm not losing my boldness. I'm going to continue to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Why, Paul? Why? So that Christ shall be magnified in my body. Paul's body was dedicated to the honoring of Christ. The word magnified means to make great or to enlarge. Paul said, I'm never going to forget what happened to me on the Damascus Road. Never going to forget those few days in that room when I was blind before Ananias came. I'll never forget what Jesus did for me. And my life is being lived to make his name great and to enlarge his name wherever I go that Christ might be magnified in my body. And Paul exhorts you and I in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. 
If you and I are going to honor Christ with our body, we may face some suffering and some persecution. But may we not complain because we understand that Christ suffered much so that he could give you and I eternal life. And may you and I be willing to bear whatever cross it is that others might know Christ. It aligned Paul with his purpose. As we close, notice, let us see that it afforded Paul some peace. I love this as you look at verse 20. That Christ might be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. The logo of a missionary organization was a picture of an ox with a plow on one side and an altar on the other. Underneath that logo and that picture were the words, ready for either. And that was Paul's motto. He had already faced the future. It didn't matter to him whether he was going to be exonerated or executed. He knew that God would accomplish his purpose through his life either way. Paul concludes this text, this portion of the letter by saying, by life or death, it doesn't matter. I'm at peace with whatever happens. I'm going in that room. I'm looking Nero in the eye. I'm speaking the truth in love. And God will handle it. And if I walk out, I walk out. And if I go to heaven, I go to heaven. I'm good. It gave Paul a peace. Sometimes you and I might tiptoe in the workplace. Well, I'm not sure what they're going to think or say. We're around some family members and we don't know if it's appropriate to talk about God. Sometimes if we're not careful, we're kind of checking the wind of everything before we know what we ought to do. And Paul said, I've got perfect peace. I'm going to go do what God wants me to do. And God will handle it. And whether by life or death, it doesn't matter. Because I'm going to fulfill the purpose that God has for my life. And the Bible says in Revelation 4, 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. You and I draw breath for the pleasure of the Lord Jesus Christ. The perspective of Paul, wow. Chained to prison guards, and all he can talk about is, look at this. The gospel is going everywhere. The problems with the other believers, oh, there was envy and strife. That could have really discouraged Paul. Paul said, I'm not getting into all that. People are being saved. We're good. He just stayed above it. Why? Because of the provision of the Spirit of God. He had a personal walk that was so deep. Part of it was others were praying for him. And it just emboldened his faith. And despite all the trial and trouble, he never lost sight. This is why God has me here. And this is what I'm doing. And even the outcome, life or death, doesn't matter. I'm here for the pleasure of of the Lord Jesus Christ. May you and I tonight, as we take this journey of joy over the next several weeks, may we learn from Paul some clarity. There might be some things going on in your life tonight that you don't understand. There might be some questions you have that you don't have answers. There might be some things unfolding that that's not the way you thought they'd go. But may you and I get into the life of Paul tonight and say, but that doesn't have to deter me from what God wants me to be. So may we benefit from the clarity of Paul and may we live with that clarity in our lives this week. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for your precious word. And we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful letter, so rich, so much for us to cover in the upcoming weeks. But tonight, as we look at the clarity of Paul, would you help us in our own heart and life to stop looking at what's going on around us and to look up to you. And may we learn from Paul tonight. And may we individually and corporately together as a church not get bogged down with the negative, and not get involved in the envy and strife, but may we stay mission-focused, pleasing Christ, sharing the gospel. 
And I pray, Lord, that you would use our church as a mighty army to please you and to share the love of Christ wherever we go. With every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking about, how many would say, Gabe, as the word of God was preached tonight, God spoke to my heart. Oh, there's some things going on I don't understand. There's some things happening I would not have chosen. But I've been encouraged tonight by the life of Paul. And I want that clarity. I want that purpose. I want that intensity. Pray for me that I would apply what we've heard and that it would help me please Christ and share the gospel. Can I pray for you tonight? Would you just raise your hand wherever you are? Pray for me that I would take what I've heard and apply it to my life. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would do the work that you desire to do in our midst tonight. May we be sensitive, tender, surrendered, and obedient. And may we apply your word and may it help us.